Hey everyone, it's JC. I am back with part three in our series of learning how to abide in the love of Christ from John 15, meaning we don't just know it intellectually, but we taste it, experience it, feel it, know, hear that he loves us personally, individually. What does that look like? And today, I think we're going to tackle one of the biggest roadblocks. The question is that we're going to deal with. If he loves us, and I hope you watch part one and two, if he does, and if his love is different, if it's deeper than human love could ever be, why does he let bad things happen to us? I mean, you you may have settled that in your heart and, and go, no, I understand that. And, and I would have said that in earlier years. I have taught of his love so much and for years taught in church and spoken of it and written of it. And, and I always did come up with an easy answer for that question. Like, oh, he has his reasons and I just, I'll trust him and just cliches. But I will tell you that the last probably, I was going to say three, but it might be closer to five years. He's, <laughs> he's taken me on a journey with this question, you guys, um, where I have gone through a season of so so many no's and disappointments and rejections and un unanswered prayers um, that uh, the cliches were not enough anymore. That I could, oh, I know he loves me and yes, his love and uh, I could give lip sort of service to it, but it started to go to such a point where my heart was hurt and it came rushing out. Like, if you love me, why then why? What is happening? Where are you? I mean, he makes us the promise over and over and over in scripture. You guys, I looked it up. Um, the idea that I won't fail you or forsake you. It's in Deuteronomy. It's in Joshua. It's in Isaiah. It's in first and second Chronicles. It's in the Psalms. It's the same concept as in Matthew and Hebrews and first and second Corinthians. Ooh, let's, let's even read. This is what I was reading the other day, which, which really it's a bold promise. This is in Psalm 91. I'm in the NIV. And you probably know this well. It says in verse three, surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings, you will find refuge and his faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness or the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side. 10,000 at your right side, but it will not come near you. All these promises in scripture that just feel like, like these amazing promises of deliverance, right? And so I had to answer for myself the last several years in a very deep and often tear filled way. If all those promises are true in scripture, why is my life going like it is right now? Because right now I'm feeling abandoned and I'm feeling forsaken and I'm feeling like you don't love me at all. <laughs> I am so trying hard not to get emotional on this one. We'll see how it goes because this goes deep for me. Um, so let's talk about a few things. I'm not going to give all the answers, but these are some of my answers that helped the most. I was thinking... Um, because I'm a mama of a big family and uh, my oldest is 32. I've been in this parent game for a long time. And it hit me the other day that mamas, our main job <laughs> that we give ourselves from when they are little tiny babies on up is we are rushing to relieve suffering, right? Make sure they're fed and clothed and warm and comfortable and happy um, we, we work our fingers to the bone to do that. We, we have sleepless nights to do that. When babies are sick, we're pacing the floor. We are making sure they're, you know, dressed adequately and, and, and fed and happy. And if there's problems with, with friends, we're in the middle of it and trying to calm things down. Our goal is to relieve suffering. It's, it's in our nature to want to do that. It's, it's the way I manifest my love for my kids is by pouring out all I have to relieve that in every way I possibly can. Um, and so what dawned on me was, I think it's really easy to get into a place where love equals relieving suffering. That's what love is. In our brain, love means you will come to someone's aid and take away the hard and make it better. 
And absolutely it means those things, right? We do do that for our children. And, it, and so I think I transferred that, <laughs> that concept to the Lord. You love me, you will relieve my suffering. And please know he has done that. He has miraculously come through for me again and again and again. That's a whole different video. I could tell you so many stories of where that has been true. And so, so I felt very loved <laughs> for a very long time because he just was so real and so present. And I could see those miracles in the small things and the big things. But the last few years, that belief system that I have, that love equals relieving suffering, that was challenged because suddenly I was brought into circumstances that were incredibly difficult and he didn't seem to be doing anything to change them. <laughs> And so suddenly I was just really rocked in my relationship. Like, wait a second, you're not playing the game the way it's supposed to be played. <laughs> this is about how it works. But then hold on, hold on. Let's think a minute about that same analogy, about the motherhood analogy. Um, whether you're a mom or not, or parent or not, we all have been in families, we know. I also, if I thought about it, I also put my children deliberately in very difficult circumstances <laughs> And I was fine with it. Like um, we, we grew up out, in the, we raised the kids out in the country. Like we had a big garden and they, we had five acres and we had animals to be taken care of. And we, they, they had to get dirty and they had to work hard and they had to clean the house and they had chores and responsibilities and they didn't like them so often. And I was like, no, I'm not relieving this suffering. Get your little booty down there and clean your room. It's disgusting, right? Like I subjected them to things that, that they weren't happy about all the time because I knew as a parent that if I didn't, I would have lazy, entitled, spoiled kids, right? Like we know that as parents, that I'm not gonna relieve so much suffering that I'm removing all hardship, that I'm never requiring anything of them. I want them to be resilient, right? I want them to be strong and be able to handle hard things and do hard things. And so of course, as I raise them, while I at times relieved suffering and absolutely did all I could to help them solve problems and be comfortable. And I also required things, hard things of them. My dad and I would be like, no, we are doing this today. I'm sorry. Quit whining about it and get outside. And no, we're not paying you for it. This is just what we're doing today. We're weeding the garden, like get out there or whatever it was. You know, lots and lots of hard work. They had to have jobs at a certain age and, and dirty, messy jobs. My boys grew up in Idaho and did, it's called spud harvest, potato harvest. And it is dirty, messy, awful work. They made good money and it's only a few weeks out of the year and they would smell like potatoes and <laughs> spend 12 hours in front of a conveyor belt and it was not fun. But we were like, yep, go ahead. Like, it'll be good for you. You need that money. Do you see the parallel? I was taking this one belief system and saying, okay, Lord, if you love me, you will take away all the difficult things. G a good God would not let bad things happen, right? That's what we hear so much in the world. But even in our own parenting, we don't act like that. Of course, he's going to lead us through hard things to make us resilient, to make us strong, but also to teach us what happens when we rely on him and the miracles that can happen in the hard. Not by removing the hard, but right in the middle of the worst circumstances, his grace can so fill us that suddenly we're just like, wait, I'm fine. I'm okay. And that's an even bigger miracle. Let's use a couple of scripture examples. I've got my laptop here um, and, and see how we can find this in scripture. One of them is in Jeremiah um, chapter 17, where it uses an analogy, an analogy of two different kinds of trees in the desert. And one, oh, I didn't, I didn't open that part. You can read that part for yourself about how those that don't trust in the Lord are like this little shrub in the desert that's dry and barren and, and, you know, not fruitful at all. But then it says, blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. Listen to this. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters and that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat cometh but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. It's this image of this beautiful, green, lush, vibrant tree planted by a river. The roots are going deep into the river. And this is what the verse says. When the heat comes, the tree is fine. When the drought comes, 
the tree's fine. Notice that this analogy does not say those who trust in the Lord will never have heat and they'll never have drought. They'll never have hardship because he will remove all their suffering. No, it says they will be so strengthened and, and centered and grounded in him that when the heat comes, they'll be fine. And when the drought comes, they will still be fruitful. This is a different um, layer to his love. If, if we keep him pinned down to that simple belief that if you love me, you will make my life easy and comfortable. <laughs> I mean, what? <laughs> like he's some Santa Claus God, right? Like you just make everything work out beautiful. Yes, sometimes he does. Yes, sometimes he does. But he also is going to lead us through quite an adventure of the lows and the highs. And I was, I've been in a low period right now, but, but it was starting to teach me, wait a second, you've got to separate JC. You've got to separate the circumstances from his love. I had tied those two together. If you love me, you will do this or that with my circumstances. If you love me, you will heal that physical issue or you, you will take away our financial problem or you will make my child stop being an idiot and help me with that or what you will change the circumstances. If you love me, you will change the circumstances. And he's taught me over the last five years. That's not how my love works. In fact, that's not how my love worked as a parent either. That's the craziest thing. So I was applying a different standard to him and his love than I was in my own love for my kids. That was, that was an eye-opening moment. Like, wait a second. Of course he's going to lead me through hard things. I do want to be resilient and I want to learn to have that, those roots so deep in him that the heat and the drought don't rock me and don't send me spiraling. I'm not on my knees going, take away the heat, take away the drought. Instead, I'm so fulfilled and strengthened and, and settled in him that I'm okay. What do you think? Let's do um, Genesis 39 because I think the story of Joseph in Egypt getting carried away into Egypt. He got kidnapped. No, his brother sold him. He wasn't kidnapped. His brother sold him as a slave, ripped away from his family and taken as a slave into Egypt. You could say what kind of good God would let that happen. But because we know the end of the story, we don't say that. We say, oh man, look what he did with Joseph's life by the end. But along the way, pretend we don't know the end. He got, he got taken as a slave, put over Potiphar's house, and then it gets even worse when he tries to have integrity with Potiphar's wife and reject her. He is thrown into prison. What kind of good God would allow that? But because we know the end of the story, we say, oh my heavens, look what he was doing. He was preparing Joseph for much bigger things to save his whole family, to become second in command under the Pharaoh, like huge things. And I think the Lord knew that as a shepherd boy <laughs> under his father, he was not prepared to lead a country, but you take him and put him in Potiphar's house and let him be in charge and let him begin to learn leadership and management. Then you take him and you put him in the prison and you let him learn management and you let him learn leadership so that he's had these experience and become stronger and stronger so that when the time comes for his full mission to be fulfilled, he's been prepared. If Joseph had said, if you love me, you wouldn't have let anything like this happen to me. It would have kept him from fulfilling his destiny, right? So could he be using those difficult things in our lives to build resilience in us, to build him in us so that our roots go even deeper than they were when the storms weren't blowing, right? And it was going to help us fulfill our own destiny. Notice also in, in, uh, in Genesis 39, it says something interesting. The verse says, oh, did I not? It's over here. Sorry, I have 12 things open on my laptop. It says in verse Gen Genesis 39, verses 2 and 3, listen to this. And the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord made all that he did to prosper in the land. So it makes two things, two points in that verse. He was with him in Potiphar's house. He was with him in the prison. And it goes on to say the same thing, that in the prison, he was, he was prosperous. It uses that word over and over and over. And sometimes we think, okay, prosper means everything goes great and nothing ever wrong goes and bad things never happen, right? 
The Hebrew word for prosper in these verses is salah, and it means to be powerful, to prevail, or to make victorious. Like the tree analogy, right? It doesn't mean hard things don't come, but we will be victorious over those things. The tree was fine in the heat. The tree was fine in the drought. Joseph was fine in the prison because the Lord was with him. My old definition of prosper was <laughs> solve everything. Never let me go through these things. I don't want to hear the word cancel cancer. I don't want to go through unemployment, which we did for a whole year. I don't want my children to stray from the Lord. Oh, that has happened. And, and he hasn't fixed it. They are still on their journey. And I'm learning to see his love differently as these hard things come. And suddenly I'm like, wait, I'm okay. These things that I thought would kill me, I'm not dead. I'm still here. And I'm see seeing a deeper sense of his love. What do you think? If we expand in our mind what love means, love means I'm going to, I'm going to require something of you, but I'm going to make something of you. Make something. Of you. That might be why those bad things are happening. Let me throw out a, a few, couple, a couple more simple ideas. You guys, this video could be three hours long. There's so much. But I'm going to include some books that I think are revolutionary. So at the end, stay, stay tuned and I'll, I'll include some that, that I think if you want to explore this further, really help. The other problem with bad things happening, bad things happening, and saying, you don't love me, you, you wouldn't let this happen, is because we have very limited sight. Take Mary and Lazarus, when Lazarus died. I would guess that when he passed and Jesus didn't come, she felt those same feelings that I felt. It, it doesn't really say that specifically in scripture, but it does say when he finally came, she ran to him and said, if you'd been here, if you would have come, he wouldn't have died. You could have fixed this. And she's weeping. And, and I've, I've said that same thing to him before. Why didn't you come? You could have changed this. I wouldn't have to go through this. Why are you letting this happen? Why weren't you here? I thought you loved me. But what did she not understand? Again, we know the end of the story. What did she not understand? He was about to work his outside of his resurrection. He was about to work the biggest miracle he would ever work, bringing someone back from being dead four days, which they believed couldn't even be possible, that the spirit had left, the spirit stayed around for three days and it leaves by then. And this was definitive. I am the Messiah. And he was choosing Martha and Mary and Lazarus to work this miracle through. She went from that devastation to absolute elation as her brother walked out of that tomb. Our limited sight can, can make us feel so hurt at times. And we can rail at him and say, you have forsaken me. Those verses aren't true. They aren't true. Look what's happening. How could this be anything but you forsaking me or abandoning me? And man, I've had to remind myself, JC, you were a child in terms of your understanding of the big picture. If you don't understand right now, just take a breath. He knows the end. He knows what's happening. He knows what this is all about and why we had to walk this path, right? My limited understanding, it's just like Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways, or your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I've, I've constantly had to remind myself, I am a child before him. It's like a four-year-old demanding that the mother explain the family finances, right? <laughs> and the mom's going, I, I, I can't do that right now. You don't have the maturity. You don't have the growth. You don't have the ability to understand this. Just know I've got you. We've got the finances taken care of. You just, just trust, trust me that we do. But sometimes we kind of like, no, I want to know what's happening. <laughs> It takes humility, you guys. It takes humility to submit to this kind of love. We want a more, a more predictable love that we can control, right? He's God. And he has reasons that are so much higher than our understanding that we can't fathom them right now. And yes, we can choose to rail at him and, and to choose to feel forsaken. Or we can say... Either, either you can open my mind and show me and give me the peace to know where this is headed, or I just trust you. I heard the analogy once of, and I don't know where I heard it, 
of a blind girl with her parent and they were on a train, I think. And he met a good friend and, and they were sitting talking and I can't remember how it went, but somehow the, the parent took the little girl and put her on the, bl on the, the blind girl and put her on that friend's lap. And she was sitting there and they were saying, you know, she wasn't freaking out. And, and she, they were saying like, do you know who's holding you? Why aren't you scared? And she said, but you know, I don't have to see because I trust you as a parent, whatever, you know, wherever you're taking me, I'm going to trust. This is a deeper level of trust. And so you can see why the last three to five years, <laughs> I've had to put in some work to shift my brain to see his love in a new way, to deepen my trust so that these kinds of circumstances didn't completely crumble my foundation and say, I, you know, I don't know. I think it's okay and safe to say that. In fact, I'm going to add another link. Um, I am going to add another link in my description box to an article from uh, Christian therapist, Dan Ollander, Dr. Dan Ollander. You guys, this, this article was huge for me. It was huge. Um, so I would, it's on the power of lament and that's all I'll say, or this, this will be a hour video. Read that, that article on lament from Dr. Dan Ollander, giving me permission to lament to God about some of the things, the things that were happening and how that shows deep trust and, and continuing to work through those things. One final reason. And if you have more reasons than I've said in this video, please like throw them in the comments. I'd love to hear them because there are more reasons, but these were my biggest ones. The last one is simple. It's Revelations 3, 319. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. We don't want that to be the answer either. But man, again, I do that with my kids. I wanted them to feel the consequences of their actions at times. And they were not happy with me about it. Did it mean I didn't love them? Absolutely not. I was doing it for their good. So perhaps he's leading us through a season where it's chastening us and, and pulling us toward repentance. If he just made us comfortable all the, all the time and relieved all our suffering and was a Santa Claus God where he gave, it, gave us everything we asked for, how would we ever be changed? I, I'm so grateful. I just, you guys, I've just <laughs> told you. Okay. I was just praying that last night. Um, I have had some very, very difficult scenarios with my kids, my adult children, making just choices and conversations. And, and it has just been so difficult. And it's been several years. It's been a couple years now where we're really wading through some deep stuff with those kiddos. Not all of them, but just a few of them. And last night in my prayer, I was having kind of a moment where it was all coming together and I could see how much I've changed through that difficult path. I'm radically different, so much less judgmental, so much more free to love. Um, anyway, I, 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 would, I would not change what I just went through and I'm still going through it with those kids because he's changed me through it. I'm different. I felt chastened, cleansed. I, my love is more pure with them instead of wanting to strangle them and control their choices. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm different. And so I was thanking him in my prayer for letting me have those difficult experiences. Can't say that I got to that overnight, but we're, we're there now. <laughs> this is a difficult question, but I think at some point for all of us as disciples, if we are disciples, we have to answer it for ourselves. And maybe it's something, I mean, I'm in my 50s. Maybe it's something I'll be keeping, I'll continue exploring as I get older in different layers. But right now, I wouldn't change the last five years. I, I his, his love feels different now and it feels deeper. And it, it's not just this fluffy, shallow, do you make me happy kind of love. It's we've gone through some tough stuff together. But he's been there every step of the way like he was with Joseph. He didn't keep Joseph out of prison and he didn't keep him out of slavery, but he was with him. And that's my experience. And that prosperity, that ability to prevail in terms of having the strength, the patience, the love that I needed to get through these things, it's been there in abundance. So looking for that, his love is showering on me everywhere in those hard things. So I can see it differently now. 
check the description box below for links to those books. Those are the ones that I believe were the biggest like game changers for me as I was trying to shift gears in my mind. But check those out. Check out the, the article too to learn more. And we will come back in the next section of this series. And we're going to go in a whole different direction after this. So I hope that was helpful. Blessings to you. Have a good week.